I'm chairman of the London Alumni um, Committee, and I would say it gives me enormous pleasure to introduce Jim this evening. Uh, I first met Jim in 1967 when I started at York, and he was my personal tutor in the history department there. By that time, he was already researching slavery, and I do recall some of the teaching he gave us on that subject. And it's been a great privilege to have been taught by him and then to have been able to maintain contact with him over the decades. So all I will say now is simply sit back and be inspired. Thank you very much indeed. Um, first of all, thanks to the Alumni uh, Association for inviting me. And thank you to all of you, wherever you are, uh, for coming to the lecture, for signing up for this lecture. Um, I've called it um, Slavery in Small Things. Uh, which seems odd. Um, odd. Here is one of the biggest, hottest topics around at the moment. And uh, to call it um, slave things seems to sort of belittle it. And I don't mean to do that. What I hope to do is to persuade you that there are ways of exploring the story of slavery in ways that we don't always think about. But actually, by looking at certain small things, we actually look at the bigger picture. That here is an extraordinary historical phenomenon that involved millions of people, that had a transforming impact uh, clean across the, the world. This is not merely a, something that affects the Americas or Africa or Europe. It's a, it's a, it, it has global ramifications in ways, again, that are not really considered. Um, of course, it's a good time to talk about it, but slavery is in the air, isn't it? I mean, slavery is everywhere. You can hardly open The Guardian, for instance, uh, every other day without finding something, some slave-related topic. Um, think about the number of institutions and people who have been um, targeted, really, for uh, profiting from slavery, um, institutions that we're all familiar with, people that we know. Um, think of the attacks on, well, the obvious one would be the statue in Bristol, or the Colston statue, uh, but cities themselves have been uh, targeted, uh, the prosperity that came the way of Liverpool. Um, Oxford colleges, I mean, all Souls College, Oxford, with its Codrington Library, which came from Codrington Estate in Barbados, a slave plantation. Um, banks, insurance company, Lloyds, have very clear um, slave links. Um, Parliament itself, Parliament itself uh, is absolutely central to this whole story. Any number of Acts of Parliament flowed out of Westminster from the uh, mid 17th century onwards to facilitate, to shore up and to make possible the extraordinary story of um, Atlantic slavery, the enslavement of millions of Africans for the benefit of, of the Western world. Uh, I think too, and again, this is something that's really been um, avoided in many respects, and that is think of the ro of royalty. Um, royalty is deeply involved in this story. Uh, the Royal African Company, given the monopoly in shipping Africans for a, a relatively short period. I mean, the Duke of York, the then Duke of York, late 17th century, became James II. Uh, had his slaves branded uh, uh, D O uh, Y on their shoulder to note, to note that they belonged to the Duke of York. Um, think of think of stately homes. Any number of stately homes that are clearly um, slave um, related. The most famous, the best best known, certainly in this part of the world, is is Harwood House. And I'll return to that in just a second. Um, in fact, slavery is everywhere. Um, this, the point, I'm, the basic point of um, my discussion is that. Slavery is so ubiquitous that if you scratch the surface of a British history um, from about, say, 1650 onwards, from mid, mid 17th century onwards, scratch it, you'll find slavery in ways that you might not expect it. It is ubiquitous and it's uh, tremendously pervasive. Um, of course, it's related to the rise of, the, of a great British empire. And you can't, I th don't really think you can understand the rise of, of the United Kingdom after the emergence of the Union uh, with Scotland in the early 18th century. You can't really understand the emergence of the United Kingdom without the story of empire. The, the empire and the United Kingdom go uh, hand in hand. And at the heart of that relationship is slavery in the Americas. Now, one of the, I think one of the problems of the last um, 12 months um, has been the concentration on elite institutions. And the, what happened in the last 12 months has been quite extraordinary. And that is, in, in the wake of the, the George Floyd uh, killing, um, 
and the uh, explosion of interest in Black Lives Matter, again on both sides of the Atlantic, has led to a kind of popular outcry that's focused on slavery. But in this country, much of it has concentrated on um, elite institutions, that is the major institutions that seem to have profited most from their involvement with Atlantic slavery. Um, but what about others? If we can step back from, uh, from elite institutions for a second and think of ordinary people, uh, you get some sense of the way in which slavery is pervasive. But think of the tens of thousands of men who worked on the slave ships. The slave ships are an enormous industry, uh, focused particularly by the late 18th century on Liverpool. Tens of thousands of men, ordinary men, rough working men, make a living of a kind working on the slave ships. Now, who thinks of them as some kind of beneficiaries of the slave system? Who thinks of the people who built the slave ships or who built the guns and the armaments that made those slave ships secure against their African cargoes? Um, what about the working people who processed the commodities that slaves uh, cultivated? Tobacco in Glasgow, um, sugar, Bristol and Liverpool, um, cotton later in um, uh, through Liverpool. Um, and then think too of um, the consumers of these slave grown commodities. These are commodities which transform the cultural habits of, of the, the, the Western world. And then later, of course, of the wider world itself. If we look at Liverpool, for instance, so again, it's an easy target, but it's an obvious one. If you look at Liverpool, we now know that something like one African in five crosses the uh, Atlantic in a ship from, from Liverpool, one African in five. Something like 1.2 million Africans are transported across the Atlantic in ships out of Liverpool. Uh, how can you think of the story of the history of Liverpool without thinking of slavery? Now, until 1992, I, I, I mentioned this because I was called in as a kind of consultant on this, but until 1992, the Maritime Museum in Liverpool had no mention of the slave trade, none. It had a little corner with a triangular trade map and a, a, a make-believe bag of sugar at the bottom, and that was it. Now, of course, we've got a whole museum devoted to slavery itself, but some fantastic recognition of the impact of slavery in that city, uh, funded initially by the Britain Morse Foundation. That really transformed the whole story in Liverpool. Um, but when we think really of the people who consumed slave-grown commodities, the whole question of the impact of slavery spreads out to the whole community. Let me digress a little and try to illustrate this by uh, a slight autobiographical uh, digression. I was born and raised in North Manchester in a place called Failsworth, and I spent all my childhood days uh, in the 1940s and 50s in North Manchester, um, Failsworth, but particularly with my grandparents in Oldham. We, our house I was born in and lived in, um, we were literally overshadowed by a huge mill factory, the Gladstone Mill. Uh, my grandparents were textile workers, the whole landscape was hemmed in by factories, by mills. Um, the landscape, you stood back on this one little hill, I used to do it regularly, so try and count the factory chimneys, uh, travel around 360 degrees, and there was a kind of panorama of factory chimneys. And to the north, they were entirely textile factories. Those textile factories were producing cotton goods, textiles that were shipped out of Liverpool. But where did the cotton come from? Well, pretty obvious really. Until 1860, that cotton came from the South, from the US South, and it came courtesy of slaves working in the, the, the steaming cotton fields of um, the Melta, the, 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 the Mississippi Delta. Um, by 1860, when um, the Civil War ended, effectively ended slavery, um, there were four million slaves working in the United States, not all in cotton, of course, uh, they worked throughout any kind of occupation you can think of, but the majority are in cotton. But who thought of that? I, as a young kid, interested in history and history, interested in the, of the world I lived in, this kind of working class area of the north of England, never, the penny didn't drop that somehow or other that world of textile and cotton was directly related to slavery, to the slaves in the US cotton belt before 1860. One other way of illustrating this is to look at the coat of arms of the city of Manchester. I went to school in Manchester and part of the coat of arms was on my school badge. Um, we had a bee. Now, the bee has made a comeback, hasn't it, as a kind of motif presenting Manchester, representing Manchester. 
The coat of arms of Manchester, when the city was incorporated in 1842, it has a B on it, got industry, busy, we're busy here, we're an industrious folk. It has the rose, the Lancashire, the red rose. Uh, it also has a sailing ship. Now that's pretty curious if you think, but here's a landlocked city that's 30, 40 miles away from the sea, nearest sea is Liverpool, and yet it's chosen as a motif to represent itself in its coat of arms, a sailing ship. Well, of course, and if you want to see that, of course, just look at the, the, the shirts of the two football teams. They still have that emblem on their shirts as they play today. That sailing ship, of course, represents cotton. It's cotton in, textiles out. And it's the link between Manchester, Liverpool, and the cotton south. Slavery is right at the heart of it, and you can see it under simple, a simple glance at the coat of arms of the city of Manchester. There are any number of other ways of thinking of this. Think of the ways in which the British become addicted to sweet tea. We, I, most of us drink tea. I grew, grew up with a teapot permanently on the table and alongside a bag of sugar. That addiction to sweet tea, which becomes a kind of caricature, really, of British life, uh, really emerges in the um, 18th century. If you think of it, it's a very curious phenomenon. You have tea, which actually comes from China, there's no Indian tea at the time. The tea from China shipped via the East India Company through India onto Britain is then mixed with cane sugar, which had been cultivated by Africans in the Caribbean. Think of it for a second. China, India, the Caribbean, all linked into something which becomes quintessentially British, a sweet cup of tea. That gives you some sense of the role of slavery in producing sugar and the way in which it creates kind of social habits and patterns that we're so familiar with that we don't really question the kind of historical nexus that makes all this possible. Think of uh, American, think of North Americans, Americans and Canadians, uh, and their addiction to coffee. That, that again emerges really in the 19th century. Coffee, the great coffee producer of the 18th century is the island of Saint-Domingue, what is now Haiti, the French slave colony. That produces more coffee on the eve of the French Revolution than anywhere else. Now, coffee, like sugar, is an alien commodity. It's imported into the Caribbean. But that coffee industry of, uh, of Haiti, of Saint-Domingue, is destroyed by the great slave uprising of 1791. And thereafter, coffee is transplanted into Brazil, and it's Brazilian coffee that booms in the 19th century. Americans develop their taste, their passion for coffee in the 19th century, courtesy of Brazilian coffee. And who grows that coffee in the 19th century, in 19th century Brazil? Slaves. Americans mix that coffee with huge quantities of sugar. And who cultivates that sugar? It's sugar that comes from Cuba. You can't understand the American in, uh, interest in, and influence in the history of Cuba unless you remember this, not merely the geographic proximity, but the relationship that starts in the slave days. Slaves produce huge volumes of sugar which go to sweeten the bitter coffee taste that came from slave-grown uh, plantations of Brazil. These three drinks, tea, coffee, and chocolate, all of them bitter drinks, all of them consumed in their natural habitat, corn of Africa for coffee, tea for, uh, in China, chocolate in Mexico, all of them not consumed with the addition of sugar, all of them taken as a kind of bitter drink. It's the Europeans that mix those drinks with sweetness, cane sugar, that makes it palatable to the Western world. And that is made possible by the Africans cultivating sugarcane in the Caribbean and in Brazil. All of this is made possible by Africans. For all the Africans, for all the Europeans that cross the Atlantic, up until the 1860s, 80, up until the 1820s, the great majority are uh, Africans. There are more Africans, four to one Africans, travel across the Atlantic in the years up to 1820 than Europeans. There's a case to be made that the real pioneer of the Americas until 1820 is the African. And at that point, it's worth giving some basic, simple figures really about the slave trade, because this is what makes it possible. The, en the engine behind this is the quite extraordinary and grotesque and forced movement of Africans from Africa to be scattered across the, uh, the eastern shores of the, the Americas. We know that something like um, 12 million Africans were loaded onto the slave ships 
There's no doubt about this now. Um, you know, we've got the figures down to fine detail. Something like 12 million plus Africans loaded onto the slave ships from every maritime power in Western Europe and increasingly from North Americans. Americans from Rhode Island right through to Rio. Rio becomes the great slaving port of the, of the whole of the Atlantic. Many more ships from Rio take Africans back to Brazil. Brazil is the great engine that sucks Africans across the Atlantic. Um, 12 plus million loaded onto the slave ships, something like 11 million plus survive to landfall, which means that the very great majority of Africans do make it because they make it in a, a wretched condition. And in the, in the two to three years after landing, a very large number die of conditions that they contracted on the slave ships. So, but the majority of the, uh, arrive alive. A million and a half, million and a bit don't make it. And it's no accident, and this is something that would get very interesting in development, that people are now working on the, the, the way sharks behave. Sharks gather in huge numbers off the slaving uh, positions of West Africa. They follow the slave ships across the Atlantic, and they gather in the harbors of the Caribbean waiting for the dead to be thrown overboard. I don't want to labor this too much, but it is a grotesque system by, by any calculation, more grotesque in reality than any historian can imagine. I mean, these are ships that can be smelt five, seven miles downwind. The conditions that uh, the surviving Africans have endured is uh, beyond, uh, beyond imagination. There's no one, there's no, there is no one uh, slave system in the Atlantic. It's, there are really two systems that's shaped by the navigational factors, by currents and by prevailing winds. There's a South Atlantic system, which takes the uh, ships to uh, Brazil and South America. And there's the Northern system, which operates in a different uh, anti-clockwise fashion, that um, takes um, uh, Africans to the Caribbean and to um, uh, North, North America. One of the questions you might ask though is why ship Africans such huge distances uh, to produce commodities that the Western world have done without since time out of mind? And why ship on very dangerous voyages, not to, say, not to mention the cruelty involved, but hugely dangerous cross, uh, transatlantic uh, crossings? Why take millions of Africans from their homelands? Why don't you cultivate sugar elsewhere? Why do you cultivate sugar in Africa? Why don't you cultivate sugar in the Americas with a different form of labor? Well, in Africa, of course, white people don't survive. It's not really until the, the mid and late 19th century that whites begin to, to survive in tropical Africa. They succumb in huge numbers, including from the slave ships, uh, from tropical diseases to which they have no resistance. Africa is a dangerous place, not, not just for Europeans, of course, but especially for Europeans. Um, but what about um, using Indian labor in the Americas? Well, the Europeans do do that. They do use Indian labor clean across the Americas, especially in Brazil and especially in uh, Spanish America. We now know there's a really brilliant book being published recently on what is called the, the other slavery, and that is the, the enslavement of Indians in Spanish America. It's thought that something like two and a half to five million Indians were enslaved in the years uh, before 1900 by uh, Spaniards in their, what become the, the Spanish colonies in the Americas. The Europeans turn, because the sugar is an extraordinary labor intensive business, the Europeans turn to Africa where they'd already been using slaves up and down the coast of West Africa before they make the great leap across the Atlantic. Columbus knew of slave systems in uh, the in Eastern Atlantic long before he stepped ashore in the Americas. Africans and sugar are what makes this whole system come in, come, in to come together. First of all, in these small islands of San Tome, then in Brazil, and then in the Caribbean. Another way of looking at the impact of, um, of sugar is, this raises another delicate issue, and that, and that is to look at the, um, the way 18th century porcelain evolved. The porcelain uh, sets, tea sets and coffee sets that you see in stately homes and museums everywhere with their beautiful artifacts, the sev uh, items that you'll see any number of museums, those were produced initially by the Chinese. Chinese porcelain before the European sev and others cottoned on to how to make uh, porcelain, that the Chinese produced sugar bowls for the sets of coffee and tea sets that they shipped to Western Europe, but they don't produce it for their own markets because the Chinese don't use sugar. They produce these sugar bowls for export and they produce it for export because the Western world has become addicted to the addition of sugar with their 
drinks, tea and coffee and chocolate. Now you see this really, as I've mentioned, in museums and stately homes, but have a look round when you're in those same places and have a look at other items that might give you some clue about the impact of slavery. If you go to Harwood House, and I'll turn to this in a second, if you go to Harwood House, short drive from where I'm speaking, um, and go to the state dining room, there is an absolutely magnificent Chippendale uh, dining furnishings all around the room. It's a room built for the Lessels, the Harwoods. It's a magnificent piece of craftsmanship. Now that um, dining furniture is made from mahogany. And any number of museums and galleries, stately homes, uh, display their items of the mahogany furniture as a feature of the, um, the way in which uh, fashion evolved in the late 17th, early 18th century. It's in the 18th century that mahogany comes of age. And it does so courtesy of slaves working in the rainforests of, first of all, of Jamaica, but then when that runs out, uh, the Mosquito Coast, what is now Honduras, Belize, um, the mahogany that shipped into England is shipped into Lancaster. Who thinks of Lancaster as having anything to do with slave trade or slavery? But from very small beginnings, Lancaster becomes a slaving port. We know of 122 voyages that left Lancaster for Africa for slaves, thence to the Americas, and increasingly returning, first of all, as ballast, but then from, 18, from 1720 onwards with uh, mahogany planks for the craftsmen, for gillows, that subsequently had a, a major shock in Oxford Street until very recently, where the craftsmen worked on those um, uh, mahogany planks to produce the great craftsmanship of, um, that we see in Harwood House. But who'd think of slavery when you look at mahogany furnishings and Chippendale's furnishings? And any number of institutions have now really got wise to the fact that although they're looking, they're presenting their artifacts as items of great beauty from the past, they actually have a direct link to slavery. And this is where the current arguments, for instance, about English heritage and the National Trust come in. Not just the buildings, but the contents of those buildings, beautiful ceramics, beautiful furnishings, which take you straight back to the story of slavery. If you look elsewhere for signs of slavery, you'll, again, it, it hits you. If you were to look into the, the log books of um, the, the ships leaving English ports for West Africa, you'll find another quite extraordinary story. The cargoes that filled, uh, filled the slave ships heading for West Africa to exchange commodities for Africans, they're filled with particular kinds of goods. Something like 50% of all the goods shipped to West Africa to be exchanged for slaves take the form of textiles. And not as you might imagine textiles from Yorkshire and Lancashire, although there are those. The great bulk of the textiles that are shipped to West Africa to be exchanged for African slaves come from India. Now, here's a curious story for you. Indian textiles that are shipped from India across the Indian Ocean, sail west across the South Atlantic, then back east across the North Atlantic to Europe, where it's transshipped at merchant houses onto ships in Liverpool and Bristol, thence to West Africa. This is extremely well-traveled textile goods. Now, the curious thing about this is that it, it's the Portuguese in their early settlement of India have tapped into this quite extraordinary existing textile industry that produced textiles of a, on a range from the crudest to the most beautiful of a range and of colors and of patterns that the Europeans simply couldn't match. And what we now know is that from the, by the mid 18th century, Lancashire cotton producers are imitating Indian textiles in order to compete with them in the exchange markets of West Africa. This is a quite extraordinary story. And as someone who grew up under the shadow of the textile mill, I used to feel very aggrieved in the 1950s when it was clear that the Indian textiles were outselling Lancashire textiles. What I didn't know, and the penny didn't drop until much, much later, what I didn't know, of course, was the whole process had been the other way around. It was actually the English textile industry that first of all competed with, copied, and then eventually undermined uh, their Indian competitors. Think of it, a quite extraordinary transfer of goods from India to West Africa to be exchanged for African slaves. 
Now, it's not just um, textiles. If you look in those cargoes of the outbound ships, there are many other goods. Along, along with textiles, iron and metalware are very, very big items. Uh, copper items, particularly out of uh, Bristol, they used to be called guinea pants or guinea kettles. Well, what does that tell you where they're heading? Um, any number of firearms. There's a huge um, slave, uh, a, a huge trade in firearms to Africa to exchange for Africans. There is an arms trade uh, which gives power to local leaderships and that undermines uh, their opponents. Whether those armaments work doesn't matter, but they, a bit like nuclear weapons in reserve, they, they, they impose fear on the people who don't have them. There's a huge volume, uh, the volumes are very easily traced, but an enormous volume of firearms that go to West Africa to be exchanged for um, enslaved Africans. So you have these extraordinary mixed cargoes with um, textiles dominating and metal goods being a, a major item. But another major item that we would never mention are uh, cowrie shells, those very beautiful little shells that come from, uh, well, actually all over the tropics, but especially from the Maldive Islands in the middle of the Indian Ocean. Europeans begin to use these as a means of exchange on the coast of West Africa. Now, cowrie shells, those very beautiful little things, had been used for centuries before in China, in India, uh, in other societies, and in Arabia, uh, as, as a means of exchange. They're like coins, they're easily transported, you can't uh, forge them. Uh, and that's exactly what happens in West Africa. They are used as coins, effectively, as a means of exchange. But the volumes of cowrie shells that eventually find their way to West Africa is simply uh, staggering. They're dried out in the, on the beaches in the Maldives, shipped to India, thence back around the Cape of Good Hope to Europe, thence to West Africa. It's thought that something like 10 billion shells travel to West Africa on that protracted route alongside the Indian textiles in the years between 1700 and 1790, 10 billion. I mean, it is a phenomenally large international business. Now, when in fact, those carries, of course, today are used as decorative items by uh, African women, by African-American women, Afri Afro-Caribbean women, part of their hair, part of their clothing. Uh, they also appear on the coinage of Ghana, uh, sidestepping the fact that, in fact, they were originally there as a um, means of buying slaves. Um, if you think of these items that I just mentioned from India, uh, textiles and cowrie shells, what you're looking at is not just, it's not a triangular trade. We use the word a triangular trade to kind of sum up the story of uh, what's happening with Africans in the world of the Atlantic. But it's not triangular, it's actually global, that all this is made possible by the movement of goods and people from the far side of the Indian Ocean. And not only that, of course, there are commodities that go from the Americas to Africa as well. There's an extraordinary trade from Brazil across to Africa in tobacco. There's a huge flow of tobacco into Africa to be exchanged for slaves. Now, who grew the tobacco in Brazil? Slaves. There's a real irony to this that slaves in Brazil are producing a commodity, which are then used as a means of exchange to get more Africans shipped back to Brazil. One of the byproducts of the sugar cultivation was rum, and huge volumes of rum are shipped up to New England through the distilleries of New England, and the rum is used in extraordinary barter and change exchange with the Indian peoples of the American frontiers. The Europeans' dealings with American Indians is facilitated, lubricated by the drunkenness that is induced by the use of rum as a means of getting pelts and furs back from the peoples of Indian societies. Alcohol is a kind of one of the great corrosive factors in imperial exchange. But in this case, where did the rum come from? It came from sugar. And who cultivated sugar? The Africans. So you've got Africans in the Caribbean producing rum, which is distilled in New England and then exchanged for furs and pelts for, the, for, for Indian people. Now, in all of this, it's not just a, a kind of accidental um, economic growth. The state is involved in this. All the European states are very anxious to promote their own interest in slaving. The British are become uh, the dominant slave trader in the North Atlantic, the Portuguese and the Brazil, Brazilians in the South. The British state is absolutely up to its eyes in slavery. Any number of acts of parliament making all this possible. Not only that, of course, but the Royal Navy 
is absolutely critical. The Royal Navy is a key. The Royal Navy guards our slaving positions off West Africa. It guards the slave routes across the Atlantic. It guards the slave colonies in the Americas. And more particularly, the Royal Navy is critical in keeping the slaves in place. The Royal Navy is vital in any number of slave rebellions in moving men to and from the islands and around the islands. There was a great slave rebellion in 1760, the Techies revolt in Jamaica, which would, could easily have blown the whole system apart as was to happen in Haiti next door um, only 30 years later. But the Royal Navy could actually move men, guns and equipment around the island quickly and put it down. The Navy is absolutely vital. And it's, the irony is, of course, that um, uh, the, the Royal Navy marching song uses the words, um, um, Britons never will be slaves. Um, the, the marching song of the, the Royal Navy incorporates imagery of slavery, but people don't make the link that this is the point at which the Royal Navy is actually being used to sustain the slave system in the Americas. The state is absolutely important. And if you want to, and, and anyone takes a cruise in the Caribbean, you'll see it. Start at the magnificent ha harbour in Havana and sail south. And you'll pass one island after another that is still extraordinary 18th century uh, fortifications, French, Spanish, Dutch, British, um, all defending their slave colonies and all using the power of the state to keep other Europeans out, but more especially to keep the lid on the Africans who are incarcerated on the islands, on the plantations. Now, if you want to look at the state, of course, it's come full circle more recently the question of what happened in 1833. And the big question behind all of this is, why does the West turn its back? If it is making so much money, if it is so important, why, why on earth end it? Is it unprofitable? No longer making money? Is it immoral? Is it irreligious? If it's irreligious in 1830s, why wasn't it in 1730s, 1630s? Slavery in Brazil continues till 1888, in Cuba, 1886. Why, is it, why does it end differently in different places? The big, big questions about the ending of slavery. In the British case, it ends with the most extraordinary act of slave trading of all time, and that is the 1833 Compensation Act, which sets aside 20 million pounds, brokered by the Rothschilds, 20 million pounds to be allocated on a per capita basis to the slave owners, not to the slaves, to the slave owners. And it's at this point, of course, that uh, we run into a kind of modern argument, which is now created uh, right at the heart of the Black Lives Matter story, that if you can set aside 20 million pounds in 1833, the largest capital sum up to that point, apart from warfare that Parliament had, had created, uh, if you could do that then, how about compensation for the slaves now? You can see how a contemporary argument is built on the back of something that actually is historically grounded. Um, I don't want to go into the question of reparations now, but I think what I'm trying to do is to try and suggest that what we're looking at here is a historical story that actually is with us in ways that we don't often recognize. It's, it's, it's pervasive in the world that we live in. It made us what we were in ways that we simply don't recognize. But not only that, of course, it's not like any other historical uh, problem. It's not like the medieval wool trade. You know, people have got very strong feelings about this. It's a, it touches all kinds of raw nerves. And you can see why amongst the people who are descended from slave families, ultimately a long time ago perhaps, but nonetheless, who look at these stories and who now in this kind of cascade of information we have about slavery, look at these stories and think of their ancestors and think the terribly painful story that was the story of their ancestors' lives. We have any number of um, uh, sources of information that the abundance of information about slavery is great, I think is greater than for any other institution you can think of. We have more information about the Africans who go into the Americas than any other comparable working people. From the moment they step on a slave ship to the moment they die, we know their ailments, we know their physical characteristics, we know what they look like, we know what they die of. We don't have that kind of detail for any other working group until uh, 19th century and later. And yet, despite all that, the story of slavery was kind of kept in the background uh, for all kinds of perfectly understandable reasons. And it's only in the last, uh, what, 20, 25 years that it's gradually become center stage. And now, of course, it's hard to avoid it. Um, and for those, those was like myself, Peter mentioned, Peter Burley mentioned right at the beginning, when we first met, I was, I just started work on slavery. You know, I started work on this in 1967, the summer of 1967 pouring over huge 18th century plantation lectures in Jamaica. And what leapt off the page straight away my first day 
list of slaves alongside their names, their age, their ailments, and on the other side, the list of the cattle. If you want some direct entry to the story of slavery and the transmutation of humans, of Africans, into objects, it's the comparison with uh, cattle. And therein lies the story of slavery. The reduction of these millions of people to items of trade, to things, to objects, with a price on their head. And it's that really that created this absolute cornucopia of material because they were items of economic transaction. And yet, curiously enough, it's only recently come center stage. I've said enough, I've spoken for almost 40 minutes. Let me just read to you one piece of information, one piece of evidence, the kind of which you can find scattered throughout um, uh, newspaper sources um, on both sides of the Atlantic. This is a, an advert for a Brazilian slave in, 18, in Sao Paulo, 1872. He's described by someone who wants him back. He speaks with a high voice and always looked frightened. He has some teeth missing in front and lettering on his forehead and on the palms of his hand, of his hand which says, Slave of Dona Fortunata, always wears a cap on his head or a handkerchief to hide the letters on his forehead. That's one slave in Brazil. And finally, an advert for a runaway slave in Jamaica. This is 1790. He's runaways of the Coromante nation. He is artful. He speaks the English, French, Dutch, Danish, and Portuguese languages. How about that for a slave? Thank you very much. Thank you, Jim. Thank you. Um, right, let's go through some of the questions that, that you would like to pose to Jim. One person has asked, how entwined was the insurance industry with the slave trade, Jim? Um, very, um, it's maritime trade. Uh, the, the development of, the, of the, the, the slave trade in the 18th century spawns uh, insurance coverage because the Africans are cargo and every single maritime country, the French, the Dutch, uh, the Swedes, the English, they all have their own ways of insuring it. All of them need to insure their cargoes because they are objects, because they're items of trade, uh, they have a price on their head. And the arguments that then evolve are when do you give the, uh, the people who own the slaves uh, their money back? Do you, do you, are they insured when they just die? If they just die of natural causes, whatever that those are on a slave ship, uh, do you pay for it? Well, the, in, the, in the English case, the answer is no. If they're killed in an uprising, if they're shot, if they're murdered by being thrown overboard, just to quell a rebellion, then you can claim your insurance. If they die in, in a, a wreck, as they sometimes, and of course the crew abandon the wrecked ship and leave them entombed below, uh, then you can get your insurance. And this all comes to a head in the great uh, Zong case of 18, 1783, uh, when 133 were thrown overboard and killed. Uh, they were murdered, it's a massacre. And the uh, Liverpool owners claimed for the loss of them, although there'd been no apparent reason why they should have been thrown overboard. Uh, but the answer is that insurance, maritime insurance is, is absolutely critical to the successful commercial ventures on, on the slave ships. Thank you, Jim. We have another question here around the impact of cowrie shells on the economy of the West African trading communities and how the influx of those cowrie shells impacted on that, um, which also leads on to records that somebody has seen around the trade in red lead alongside cowries um, in the East India Company archives. Mm. How does that fit into the whole trading picture? That red lead I know nothing about. That's news to me. I don't. I don't, don't know. Uh, cowrie shells uh, become an integral feature of uh, economic exchange in West Africa. And the best way into it is this absolutely magnificent book by uh, um, Toby Green, A Fistful of Shells, which has won all kinds of awards. Uh, and it's a study really of, um, it's, it, it, the subtitle is West Africa from the rise of the slave trade to the age of revolution. And it, 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 it it uses the cowrie as a means of uh, looking at economic change and, and, and economic fortunes uh, across a wide stretch of West Africa affected by slavery. It's uh, 
the cowries become a means of exchange. They used they used as, as form of payment. Men are paid in cowries. Uh, certain African slave traders assess how many cowries a, a slave is worth. I mean, how many would they expect to get in return for one African? Normally, they wouldn't do it by by one item. It's normally a certain amount of cowries. Um, a couple of guns and certain volume of textiles. That's the way what's called a parcel of exchange. But certainly, Cairo is absolutely central. It's what happens after the, the, the rise of slavery in West Africa with the European ships. Thank you. Many questions coming in around the abolition of the slave trade and what do you believe were the key drivers leading to that and why it took so long to be abolished? Well, it took so long because people didn't really think that there was anything wrong with slavery and slave trade. Um, I mean, it's, it, it is one of the great, it's very difficult topic to teach because uh, young people, young students, I found this especially true in North America. I mean, um, young people find it very hard to accept that uh, God-fearing people went about this godless task and didn't see any kind of friction or contradiction. Uh, um, most people didn't think of this as something that is immoral wrong or irreligious and it's really only in the late 18th century that that feeling that there's something wrong both um, theologically and um, in secular terms with slavery that the tide begins to change one illustration in 1759 john newton the author of amazing grace john newton is docked at sandy point in saint kitts next to a man called knox another slave captain and they're emptying their slave ships of africans and they're crew of fumigating the slave decks. These two men are talking about theology. They're both amateur theologians. And every night they sit talking about grace. How does a man acquire grace? Whilst all the time the stink of the slave decks in their nostrils. Now, how do you explain this? How do you explain this conflict? The truth is most people didn't see any kind of contradiction. And abolition comes late because A, slavery makes huge amounts of money and B, most people don't think it's very much ethically wrong with it. And those that do think there's something wrong are completely uh, outshouted by um, the voices of economic profit. Thank you, Jim. Questions coming in thick and fast. I'm trying to get through as many of them as possible by grouping them together for us. So lots of people asking around um, the, what we know about the percentage of ships that were lost um, and relating that to the comments that you made earlier about how people were recompensed financially depending on how slaves died. There, there is a huge number of uh, uh, ships lost but most of course are just in the way that other vessels are lost at sea in, in storms and unexpected navigational errors. Um, it's one of the great problems of the Royal Navy. I mean, a whole fleet is lost at one point off the Scilly Islands uh, in the 18th century. Um, the whole question about navigation is a, 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 a serious problem for the slave ships as for everybody else. So, but um, uh, what, what proportion of slave ships are lost? I, I simply don't know. I mean, one could find out. Uh, again, this is something I didn't mention. All of this is online. I mean, all of this material is now online. This is one of the great revolutions in our historical understanding. Look up slavevoyages.org. Anyone who wants to follow any of this up, slavevoyages.org, and you'll find the answers. That's a brilliant, absolutely revolutionary system. And it's, it's a wonderful tool for teaching as well. Not that I teach anymore, but nonetheless, it's a marvelous, it's a, it's a marvelous uh, revolutionary uh, force for the way we understand slavery. Uh, I can't answer that question directly, but the answer will lies in that particular website. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so, uh, Monish has mentioned the, um, an effort, which I've never heard of, I have to confess, to use Irish um, as slaves in Barbados. Have you ever yes. come across that? Yes. Um, it's a good day to talk about it, isn't it? Uh, is it St. Patrick's Day? Uh, was that yesterday? Um, anyway, uh, yes. Um, the, 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 the English have no problem about shipping um, insurgent people far away. You know, they do the Irish in the 17th century. They the Scots, of course, and the Highland clearances. I mean, uh, the, the English are very generous with the lives of others. We, I've been talking about Africans mainly, but the, the English have done it to many others. It's not just uh, the Irish, of course. It's, it's criminals. It's rebels. It's one way of solving social political problems, is actually, is to ship people abroad. And to North America or to the Caribbean. That ends uh, with A, the rise of slavery because slavery is cheaper to work the colonies 
and it ends, of course, with the emergence of the United States after 1776. We can no longer send people to North America. And what that leads to, of course, is the development of the, um, the convict fleets to Australia. Um, the, the, move, the, the enforced shipping of people abroad becomes a way of dealing with these uh, range of, of problems. Um, but equally, of course, when the British, the British then pride themselves in ending their slave system, their slave trade in 1807, slave system 1830s, but they then turn to India for indentured labor, which is not ended until 1919. I mean, huge numbers of Indians are shipped to East Africa, to the Indian Ocean Islands, to the Caribbean, and later to the South Pacific, uh, uh, under, under indentured contracts, which look very much like slavery. They're not the same, but they're less than free. And it's back to my basic point, really, that one of the features of English history is that the English have been, I'm not saying they're the only ones who do this, but the, the, the English have been very generous with the lives of others. It's, it's very interesting that you say that because we have, a, we have a comment here from one of my fellow Scots from Glasgow who says that they come from the city that was once called the second city of the empire. Yes. It's named, for example, we have Jamaica Street and so on and so oh, forth. Yeah. Um, it, it, would you agree that it's, there's almost not a person who hasn't in some way been involved or benefited or had some kind of role that their ancestors at well, some point have played in this? To, actually, the, the, until very recently, the Scots were kind of shy about this. Then Tom Devine, who has actually uh, first book on tobacco, didn't mention it, but now has come full full frontal attack on this, and that it's clear that the Scots are really very important in the, particularly in the tobacco trade in the Chesapeake. There are hundreds and hundreds of Scots. This is a country that is by far and away ahead of England in terms of education. You have large numbers of literate, numerate men who can't find work at home, and they go to the colonies. They go to Virginia, to the the, text, to the tobacco industries of the, uh, the Chesapeake Bay, with direct links back to Glasgow, and they scatter among the the plantations of the Americas. You'd, you'd be hard pressed to find a sugar plantation in the British Caribbean that doesn't have a Scot on board as a bookkeeper or as a manager in some capacity. In fact, I've been working on some letters in at Yale with the, between two brothers, one in Northern Jamaica and the other in uh, Scotland. Back and forth, letters for 40 years, managing each other's properties. It's an extraordinary phenomenon, this highly literate world of Scots, which the English in the Jamaica and English in Virginia don't like it because A, they're brighter than them, they're more literate and they work harder. Um, the Scots and slavery and the Scots in the slave system are absolutely central for the British story. Um, there's, thank you, Jim. There've been some comments around our the phraseology that we use and the terminology that we use. Yes. Um, and people slaves. express, yes, the word slaves using the, yeah. as opposed to enslaved people or slaves and, and so on yes. and so forth. Um, it, it, yes, well, um, it, old habits die hard. I mean, I, I, I've just finished a new book where I'm being trying to be very conscious of the, the, of the terminology. The word slave has rapidly gone out of style and has become unfashionable, become disliked in many ways. And this whole, the terminology in, in this whole area has shifted dramatically uh, over, um, uh, over my own academic career. I mean, one of my first books was called Black and White, The Negro and English Society. Now, you would never say that now. But the word has changed, you know, Negro to Black, Black with a small b, capital B, Afro-American, African-American. And what's happened with the word slaves is that that suggests that this is a natural condition of people, whereas in fact they are enslaved. So that most scholars now write about and try to speak about the enslaved or enslaved people. Uh, it, it, I, I'm programmed in a way, uh, in an old fashioned form. Uh, and I find it very difficult when I'm talking to enslaved people. I accept the point and I'm sure that um, if I carry on working in this, I mean, my own vocabulary will change. Um, at the moment I'm stuck with, I'm a bit like an, an old computer that's tr stuck with an old program. And I still say slaves, but it, I agree it should be enslaved people. And, I'm, and I, most of my colleagues, certainly all my younger colleagues, would now say it, it's enslaved people, not or enslaved, not slaves. It wasn't meant as a personal criticism, Jim. No, 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 no. It came across that way. I was, I was merely interested. You know, it, 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 I myself am guilty of using that terminology, and mm -hmm. I'm just, um, just was curious to see that. 
Um, unfortunately, we are running out of time. There are so many unanswered questions that I would love to be able to go through with you. And I do hope that you'll come back and talk to us more about this in future. There are I'm two. Happy, I'm happy, by the way, to take any questions um, by uh, email through your office, if that's if that's a possible oh, Thank you. That's extremely generous of you. Yes, please. We'll, we will make yeah. a copy of the questions. Um, and we will forward those on to you and then okay, share, that's, that's share your responses. Fine. Thank you, Jim, that's very generous. Um, there are two themes here that, that are both encouraging and, and I, don't, I don't really have the words, but one is that everybody um, is concerned to think about what we go, where we go from here, about how we educate people in the future. Okay. And I don't think there's one quick answer for that. Um, and the other one is one that you have you've specifically said that you didn't particularly want to touch on this evening, and that's around the theme of repatriation, or reparation, I should reparation. say, um, and and how we just where how you know how how do we even begin? Well, so, very briefly, very briefly, ten years ago, um, I would have been much more dismissive about um, uh, reparations. I I don't think that's the case anymore. I mean, uh, because it depends what you mean by reparations. I mean, I I think reparations is part of reparations actually is coming clean about our own history, about coming to terms with um, aspects of our past that um, seem to be pretty clear, but which are not always accepted. I mean, it is, it is contentious, uh, but that's, that's what makes it interesting and exciting. And it's, but it's contentious in the way that is, uh, is sensitive as well. So I think that from where we go from here really is that we, we need to keep working at this, uh, the central point that slavery is uh, part of what we became, what we were, and it's part of what we what we are. I mean, how can you look at Caribbean communities in this country without thinking of uh, the role that their ancestors played in the shaping of, of Britain from uh, the, the mid 17th century onwards? So this, this isn't something that's overseas in the Americas. It's, it's something about us here and now. Jim. Thank you so much for, for such an informative and illuminating talk. A difficult, um, a difficult thing for us to shine a light on, but, but necessary um, and very welcome. Thank you. Can Thank I you, now, now pass back to Peter. Peter, if you, I believe you wanted to say a couple of words before we end this evening. Well, I just wanted to say thank you so much. <clears throat> it took me right back to York in the 1960s with the, the mind-expanding, eye-opening teaching. And I think uh, the university's reputation is so enhanced by the sort of work you were doing and the mm -hmm. teaching I enjoyed there. The one thing I regret about this evening is the way Kyla set it up for me to be involved. I couldn't post any questions. So I may take up your offer of engaging in an email dialogue. But it was absolutely fascinating, and it's wonderful to see how all this thinking and research, which I knew you were starting in the 1960s, how far it's progressed and it's moved on. And it's just a, a real pleasure to see that intellectual development and that linking with modern themes and politics. And I think I'll, I'll shut up there uh, and say thank you so much. It's been wonderful to listen to you again as good now as it was in the 1960s. And thank you so much again. Thank you very much indeed.